it's not the, the golden goose, you know, uh, of a property, but uh, we were able to uh, update the unit we lived in quite a bit. We spent about three months before moving in there, just gutting it and renovating it, and that garnered some higher rents, which definitely helps. Welcome to the Break Free Real Estate Podcast, your daily guide to financial freedom through real estate. I'm your host, Jocelyn Kaufman, and I'm here with Braxton Futrell. Um, how are you doing today, Braxton? Great. I'm excited. How are you? I'm I'm doing great. I'm super excited. You're my first interview. And so um I'm really excited to learn about your story. I know a little bit about your story, but um I don't know that much. So I'm excited to learn yeah. more about it. Um, so Braxton, do you want to just kick it off with a brief introduction about yourself? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, currently I live in uh, Taylorsville, Utah. Um, kind of, uh, well, I was kind of raised in, in the Sandy area. Uh, my family still lives there, so still pretty close to home. Um, uh, I, I guess how I got into real estate, I was uh, going to, to college at uh, UVU just studying business management, um, kind of had a few things in mind, what I wanted to do, but wasn't really set on anything. Um, there wasn't really any sort of specific calling throughout my life that I totally felt drawn to the whole time. Um, and so going through college, I, I was just trying to figure out, you know, business is, is pretty broad. I just figured I could use that degree for something. Um, just have a, a nice piece of paper for that. And then uh, along the way, I eventually just started listening to some audiobooks. I've always kind of been uh, big on reading, um, especially when I was a younger kid, kind of grew out of it during my teenage years, but obviously um, got back into it. And um, while I was listening to some audiobooks, my dad actually sent me um, a uh, The Millionaire Booklet um, by Grant Cardone. And okay. it, it's just kind of a, a short uh, uh book on real estate and that kind of got my my interest started and in that's awesome that's funny because my uh very first real estate book i ever read was by grant cardone <laughs> really oh yeah it's yeah. <laughs> a great place to start yeah He'll yeah get you fired up uh-huh so braxton do you um use your business degree for anything do you uh have you had any jobs using that um not necessarily i i, I guess maybe some jobs have uh, use that in consideration, but not directly. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I, I do remember some classes like business communication and things like that, that kind of does help in my daily life with, uh, you know, communicating with other people. But um, as far as business goes uh, to the level that I, I learned uh, through college, it's a lot of, I, I guess you could say common sense kind of stuff, just dealing cordially with people. Yeah. Yeah. And what about your family life? Are you, you're married, correct? Yeah, yeah. Um, we got married in 2019. Um, just me and my wife right now. We have a golden doodle. Um, we got him last year, so he's great, full of energy, ready for him to maybe calm down a little bit once he gets older, but um, he keeps us busy. Awesome. I have a six-month-old Berna doodle, so. Oh, really? There yeah. you go. Both look at us dogs. with the, yeah, look at us with the designer dogs. I know, yeah, just following <laughs> the trends. What, what can you do? Yeah. So you kind of explained a little bit about um, how you started thinking about real estate, you know, with the Grant Cardone book, you loved reading and learning. What made you take the first jump into actually investing in real estate? Yeah. Um, and I guess uh, kind of piggybacking off of that book, um, while I was listening to it, he touches on a, a little bit about real estate, um, I, I guess, for that book in particular, it's more of how it pertains to um, business and, uh, you know, uh, good reasons to actually mm -hmm. make money and be financially free and things like that. And while I was listening to it, I, I really had no um, context of what owning real estate looks like. And uh, he uses some examples. And when he would, they were um, very high figure number transactions. And I was like, dang, you know, what does this guy do? So I, I looked him up and obviously he's been in sales his whole life, Grant Cardone. And, um, uh, but now he, he, you know, is primarily in, in real estate investing. So that's kind of what, that kind of is what got me triggered and, and started in it. 
Um, and from there, that uh, you know, I, I just started reading and, and listening to more books. I went to a few of those, you know, seminar type things. A lot of them turn out to be, you know, the the catalyst to get you to buy their thirty thousand dollar course and stuff like that. But I did learn a lot through those. Um, and the reason uh, that piqued my interest is because um, going to college and even growing up, um, financial security, let alone financial freedom, um, was really important to me. Uh, just because I, you know, growing up with with my family, I saw somewhat of the toll um, not being totally financially secure can take on you and um, not being able to uh, spend as much time with your family as you would like. And so that's kind of what made me want to bring that into my life now before I really start growing my family and, uh, you know, bringing on these other responsibilities. And so um, after looking into real estate and realizing that this is a passive form of income, not only does my time equal money, but even if I'm not directly working on something, I can still be bringing in, um, you know, the, that money. Um, it was really important to me because then you can kind of compa- compound it after, after that. And uh, I can give more of that time towards my family. Yeah, that's great. I think that's the biggest reason most people get into real estate is um, wanting to be financially free with, with their lives. And that's our goal with this podcast is to educate as many people as we can to, um, teach them how to become financially free and be able to take control of their time and be able to spend more time with their family. So when you, when you started, were you still single or were you married? Were you, um, I I wasn't married. I was dating my current wife at the time We, we were dating for a while. Um, and so that's, uh, you know, that was always kind of part of the picture and she was on board with that. Her family also has been into, to real estate for a long time too, and owned some properties. And so that was a great resource for me to kind Mm -hmm. of learn from them as well. Awesome. So did you guys sit down, come up with a plan? Did you guys start saving money? What were your first few like baby steps towards buying that first investment property? Yeah. Um, so we, we did kind of talk about it. I don't know if there's a specific meeting where we sat down and laid it all out, but, um, I, I kind of was the one, you know, obviously learning more about it. And so she trusted my, my path. I was taking her on, you know, um, and, uh, I guess along the way, I, just because there's so much, I felt like there's so much to learn about and I was kind of nervous pulling that, that trigger. Um, I, figured, you know, what's a really good way to learn about this real estate investing thing and hopefully make some money along the way um, it, it would be to uh, become a real estate agent. And so that's when I got my, my license. Um, and I was hoping, you know, not only to, to work in that space, but to make those connections and network with other people, like-minded individuals who own property, being able to assist um, in their transactions and just to kind of see how that goes. And then uh, give me more time to analyze deals, see what makes sense for other investors and then make sense for myself. And then um, throughout that, I just kind of, uh, you know, got, an, got a sense of uh, what, uh, you know, down payment looks like, closing costs, um, financially what it would take to get there. Um, and then also what analyzing a property entails. Um, and so that, that really helped with us um, because I was basically doing that full time as my job. Um, and so that, that I would say gave me a lot of confidence once we decided to really start looking for a property because I had a lot of experience in that. Um, and so, yeah, that, that helped me, uh, feel comfortable pulling the trigger on our first property. Yeah. Awesome. I was actually the opposite. I invested for a while. Um, yeah. and then once I got the hang of it, then I was like, oh, I could be a great real estate agent. And so then yeah. I became an agent <laughs> afterwards. Um, so you have to kind of go hand in hand. Yeah. About how much time went by between you becoming an agent and buying your first property? And um, if you feel comfortable with it too, like about how many deals did you go through before you felt comfortable in buying one for yourself? Yeah. Um, it was about two years, uh, about two years before we closed on our first property. Um, so there was, there was a good amount of time. And um, dur- during that time, I was also wrapping up with, with college and, and 
um, some other jobs before I really dove into it. And then um, as far as transactions go that I, you know, helped uh, other investors with, there's probably uh, eight to 12, somewhere in there um, that, that I, I helped with, ranging from someone that is just buying a, a single family home for investment property or a home with a basement apartment up to, you know, like a fourplex, mostly small multifamily kind of things. Um, so yeah, that's, that's the, the time period it took. Yeah. Awesome. I mean, I think just doing a few transactions gives you, you learn so much, whether you're the person going through it or you're the, you're an agent representing that person, or mm -hmm. oftentimes, even if you're just a bystander and you're somewhat involved in the transaction, you can learn a lot. So yeah. our listeners, that's a good point for you guys is if, even if you're not ready to buy a property, go and try to be involved in a transaction and try to shadow someone, an investor, maybe trying to buy a property or shadow an agent. Um, most people in this line of work would be more than willing to help, help someone walk through that process with them. So, mm -hmm. so Braxton, let's do a case study on one of your properties. Um, I believe you have one picked out. Is it the first one that you bought? Yeah, yeah, that's kind of the, the first one that, that came to mind. Um, and so kind of starting from the beginning on that, we, we bought that in the spring of 2020. Um, so obviously the market here in Utah was pretty hot. It wasn't at the peak, kind of how it was uh, in 2021, but mm -hmm. it, it was getting there. Um, so I think we probably wrote seven or eight offers on properties. A lot of them we didn't even take a look at um, for, you know, one reason is because some listings don't allow showings until there's an accepted offer or there are some that we just didn't even have time to go see before they're going to be on our contract you know they're listed that morning and probably on their lunch break they're going to accept their contract there so we were just writing offers left and right going above asking price none of them got accepted um, finally we we found this one property um, in salt lake that it still made sense we were going over the asking price but it was kind of to the limit of what would make sense financially. Um, and uh, it, initially our offer didn't even get accepted. They, they accepted another one. After a few days, they backed out for one reason or another. And they came to us, the listing agent came to us, asked if we're still interested. Um, we went under contract with them. Uh, we went up and, and took a, a look at the property, met the tenants um, and needed a little bit of work. It wasn't totally run down, but it, it seemed like something we could handle. Um, and so from there, we just went under contract with them and, uh, made it happen. We're, we're happy to get in there. That's awesome. So I'm guessing you represented yourself on the deal. Is that right? I did. Yeah. yeah. It kind of helps. <laughs> yeah. So sometimes, sometimes it can help because you're able to cut out the middleman and just mm -hmm. represent yourself. But also, I think there is a lot of value, especially if you're not a real estate agent to get an agent who knows what they're doing and how to negotiate. But oh, I mean, since you, you know, are, are a fairly experienced real estate agent, I'll bet you got yourself a pretty good deal. So when you mm -hmm. were sitting down analyzing the numbers, um, I'm guessing, I'm just taking a guess here that the property wasn't cash flowing a ton of money being a property in Utah. Um, so can you just mm -hmm. talk me through like your initial cash flow analysis, what you were seeing um, before you even bought the property? Yeah. Um, so the first thing I noticed is what is that the rents were well below market value, probably about four to five hundred dollars below. And I know they price the property somewhat according to that. Um, and so I know there was uh, some room to, to add value there. And I kind of had to analyze it in two ways. Obviously, one, uh, we were planning on, on living in one of the units, I should say, is because it, it was a duplex. We were going to take advantage of an FHA loan. Um, you know, low down three and a half percent down payment loan and live in one of the units for um, about a year or so. And uh, so I had to analyze it based on that. And with the numbers we were running and, and how I analyzed it with the current market rents for the other unit, we would actually be paying, well, the, the portion of the mortgage we would be paying was going to be less than what we, were, what we were currently paying for rent. And so that made sense. And then I had to look at it as far as, you know, when we move out of the property, is it still going to make sense? And um, 
that did as well. Um, it's not the, the golden goose, you know, uh, of a property, but um, we were able to uh, update the unit. We lived in quite a bit. We spent about three months before moving in there, just gutting it and renovating it. And that garnered some higher rents, which definitely helps. Um, but overall, the uh, the rental market here in, in Utah is really strong too. And so that helps with the, the cash flow side of things. And so now not living at that property, it's done pretty well. Um, the tenants we have in there um, take care of the property. They, they, they do well there. And um, yeah, it, it ended up being a good deal for us considering that it was, it was a hot market here in Utah with, with high prices and everything. Yeah, and I think a lot of times people forget um, of all the other benefits, cash flow isn't the only one, and especially in a in a high appreciating area like Utah or right now Austin, Texas, you know areas in California, you might not get that mm -hmm. cash flow every month, but you're gonna you know you're getting a print principal reduction. Your tenants are paying down your loan every month. Um, you're also getting appreciation down the line. I'm sure you have you know, a quite, quite a bit of equity in that property still right now. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, that, that's the other thing too, is because since it has appreciated over the last year, we were able to um, take out a HELOC based on that growth and equity. Um, and we haven't used it for anything, but we have it, you know, for 20 yeah, years. Right. And if there's something that comes down the line, whether a down payment or, uh, you know, we need to fix up a property, it, it's there for us. And so that's definitely another benefit for pulling Absolutely. the trigger on that one. That's awesome. And I think, I think another thing you did uh, well was buying it as your house hacking, essentially buying it as your mm -hmm. primary residence, because the, it's really easy to justify it. If you're going to be paying less every month than you would renting from someone else, you know, so yeah, that's awesome. Good for you. When you fixed up the property, did you guys do the work yourself? Did you hire a contractor? What did that look like? Yeah. Um, that was definitely an interesting process. Um, definitely a big, uh, bigger bite than we could chew initially. Um, it definitely uh, taught us a lot about ourselves because we did do a lot of uh, work ourselves, probably 80 to 90% of it. There are some specialty things like, you know, uh, like uh, power and, and some plumbing things that we did contract out. Um, but yeah, we did a lot of it ourselves. It was great to learn those tools. Um, I, I learned a lot about what goes into uh, building a property. And then it helped me understand maintaining a property down the line. Um, if I were to do that myself, what it looks like and, and how things work. So another benefit and, and, you know, something we had to work through. Yeah. And another benefit to that too, would be when you buy another property, having a good understanding as you're walking through it without mm -hmm. having to pay an inspector, you know, you could probably understand what you're getting into and, mm -hmm. uh, most likely still pay that inspector down the line, but you know, you're able to really analyze the property properties as you're walking through. So uh, again, to our listeners, that's one thing, try to do as much you can yourself on your first few deals so that yeah. you're not always reliant on someone else. And you can tell if the contractor you do hire down the line is doing things right. If he's, if he's doing a good job or she, <laughs> so, yeah. So awesome. Um, so how many units are you at right now, Braxton? So right now we just have that one. And then the current home we live in has a basement apartment. Um, this oh, year cool. we plan to uh, look for another small multifamily property, two to four units, and kind of get the ball rolling a little quicker. Um, obviously with the market over the last couple of years, it's been crazy going back and forth, but um, I feel like we have a good handle on it and kind of have a good uh, game plan from here. Awesome. So you have outside of where you're living, you have three units that you're renting out. Right. Yep. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Do you guys manage that yourself or do you have a property manager? Yeah. Yeah. We do it all ourselves. It, um, we, we don't live too far from the other one, you know, about tw uh, 15 minutes. And so if there's something we, we just run over there or if it's more technical, like I said, you know, we have contacts that we can reach out to and, and uh, you know, talk to if, if we need to. Awesome. Do you want to quickly outline your process in finding a tenant? Yeah. Um, so with the properties that we've done so far, it luckily has been a pretty simple and quick process. 
Um, like I said, the rental demand here in Utah is pretty high. And so uh, for us, the process uh, started with us, um, you know, taking pictures of the unit. Um, Facebook Marketplace is a great place to uh, post uh, your, your listing. You can do other sites like KSL, even Zillow, um, Rentler, things like that. But the most hits that we got by far was Facebook Marketplace. Um, from there, we just got dozens and dozens of messages. Is this available? Um, only a few are, are serious and want to take a look at it. And so um, for the first unit that we rented out, we just did an open house style because it's got so many messages. We just said, you know, it's going to be available to look at between uh, two and five o'clock on this Saturday. I was over there um, and we just had some applications ready to fill out. And the first person that, you know, got us an application fee and filled it out, that's kind of the first person we looked into. Um, this other one, we did it the other way where you just show it individually. And so we had a few um, folks come by and, and take a look at it. Obviously not all of them were in love with it, but uh, for those that did want to proceed, we sent them an application. Um, and then, you know, once they got that filled out, paid the fee, we, we used a, uh, a website slash app called TurboTenant. Um, it's kind of, it, it's good, I think, for, for smaller investors starting out. Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of a one-stop shop for leases and applications and um, keeping track of maintenance and payments, things like that. So we just sent them the application through that. They filled it out. We looked over it. If it checked out, then um, we just kind of got a lease put together and, and went from there. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. I think most people when they're starting out in real estate, um, they feel like they have to hire a property manager, but especially mm -hmm. if you're going to be house hacking or you're buying something where you're going to live too. I always suggest again, trying to do it yourself because then you can learn how it should be done. And there's so many resources and tools that you can use. Um, I use mm -hmm. the online software called Inigo. Have you heard of that one? I haven't. Uh -uh. Yeah. So it's, I mean, I've looked at a bunch of different ones, but I use this one to manage all of my rentals and um, it's, it's kind of the same thing and it's free <laughs> and they have great yeah. customer service. So there's so many different tools out there that you can use to um, manage your property, even if you're doing it from a distance. Uh, yeah. Well, we are almost out of time, Braxton, but Let's wind down with some final questions. Um, okay. So I'm going to just throw them at you. Okay. What is your biggest mistake in real estate? Biggest mistake. Um, you know, I feel fortunate that I haven't had anything totally detrimental to our, our plans yet. Knock on wood. Um, but if there was one mistake that uh, would come to mind. And I, I guess it's not necessarily a mistake, but could potentially be one. And it goes back to the, the rent, uh, finding a, a tenant thing with the unit that we just moved out of. Um, there was this, there was a couple that, uh, they filled out the application. Um, and with it, their, uh, income, you know, the, the rent to income ratio was just slightly higher than what we were hoping for. Um, but everything else looked great. And uh, we did want to, want to get it filled, the, the unit filled, obviously. So I just reached out to them and kind of explained, you know, I, I don't want it to put too much, you know, financial burden on you guys, um, but they, they felt comfortable with it. And um, it's only been a couple months, but, and there hasn't been any major issues. But uh, I know it has been kind of tough for them to make those rental payments. So I guess a mistake uh, in that um, would be, I guess, just uh, stick to the, the guidelines uh, that you set for yourself a little bit more. Uh, make sure you get someone really qualified to live in that unit, even if it means taking a little bit more time to look for a, a, a you know, good tenant um, and just being really careful with that. Obviously, there's worse things that can happen. Uh, you know, units can be totally destroyed, things like that. Um, but yeah, just, just uh, really paying attention to to who you have living in, in, in your properties. Yeah, that's, I mean, I've put myself in that situation a few times and mm -hmm. it's like you, if you could redo it, maybe you just lower the rent a little bit from the start or you are more patient and wait for a tenant that meets those income qualifications because right. it's, 
not only not fair to you if they have to make their payments late or can't make their payments, but it's also not fair to the tenant as mm -hmm. well. And sometimes um, it's it seems it seems like not that big of a deal, but really, especially with things getting so expensive, like it could yeah. it could really be detrimental down the line. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, so next question: What's one thing that you wish you knew before you bought your first property? Um, there was a, a lot that I learned along the way. Um, obviously I had the benefit of working in this space for a while. So I, I did have a, a good amount of experience beforehand. Um, and I, I guess the one thing that would come to mind, and, and this is kind of probably a, a pretty generic answer is just, um, pulling the trigger quicker, um, just moving through the process quicker. And a lot of it goes back to like we were talking about with um, network networking with other individuals in the in this space. And um, for me, rather than reading all these books and watching all these YouTube videos and things like that, which were really helpful, but at the same time, they're very general and not always very specific. And so if you are able to um, uh, go to networking event, events and not only learning from those, but then sticking around and maybe asking questions with other investors who are there. Um, or like I mentioned, most people are probably one or two connections away from knowing someone who owns rental properties. And so just being able to have that conversation with them, having some questions along the way. And then once you have just a good sense of what the process looks like, and how to analyze the property in a way that makes sense to you, whether it's cash flow or appreciation, and then just analyzing the property based, start analyzing properties based on those parameters, um, just not being afraid to, to move forward and not thinking, oh, this is too good to be true, or I don't know everything about investing, and so I'm not ready for this. It's just about moving forward, pull the trigger. If you need to back out, that's fine. And for that first property, like you said, it's great to do things on your own, it treat it a lot uh, as a, a learning process because there's so much that goes into it with that first property. And so for me, I wish, you know, just moving quicker, not feeling like I have to know everything before, before uh, pulling that trigger. Yeah. I must say, I was kind of surprised that you um, were an agent for two years before you bought yeah. your first investment property. If you mm -hmm. would have just jumped in a year earlier you probably <laughs> I know that's the thing yeah we always think you know if we were two three years earlier we would have been so much uh you know better off but I, I guess my personality type I'm a planner I like to know all these different things and sometimes that causes the paralysis by analysis because I feel like there's so much to learn rather than just getting the experience yeah. And I feel like a lot of people um listening are probably in that place where they just Feel like they've waited too long or they feel like they missed their shot or they feel like they um like are never going to be able to do it because they're too old or just mm -hmm. always making these excuses for them so braxton waited two years to do it guys so it's okay yeah. <laughs> <laughs> i worked full-time in this space and it took me two years so yeah you, you could do it anytime awesome um okay next question favorite real estate book um, yeah, I, I read a lot of them, obviously, like I mentioned, probably one that was uh, the most beneficial to me was Set for Life by Scott Trench. Um, okay. It, it uh, focuses on the house hack type of thing and, and how important it is. And then he goes into the, the process pretty uh, with a lot of detail. Um, and so not only was that great for me to, to read early on, but that's one that I've been able to refer to other people who are interested in getting started. And so I know it's really beneficial to, to read that book. Awesome. I thought you were going to say your own book, Braxton. Yeah, I guess I should have, right? <laughs> so Braxton is an author. He, he wrote a short um, ebook on house hacking. Is that correct? Yes. Uh -huh. awesome. Yeah, it's, it's uh, the, your house hacking guide to uh, financial freedom. It's just awesome. a, a short little read. Yep. Great. Well, we will put um, that in the show notes as well as your favorite book so people can reference that. And then okay. one final question, Braxton, how can our listeners connect with you? Um, yeah, I don't have a, a lot of social media stuff. I, I, I'm on Instagram, Braxton Futrell. 
um, or email. Feel free to send me an email, Braxton okay. at canovogroup.com. Awesome. Yeah, we will put both of those in the show notes. And just for everyone listening, Braxton is a real estate agent with a Canova group in Utah. And so if you are in the area and you need help finding an investment property, who better than someone who has done it themselves, right? Yeah, absolutely. Feel free to reach out. All right. Well, thanks so much, Braxton. It was awesome having you on. And I'm excited to hopefully have you on again down the line. Um, yeah, let's do it. Well, that's it for today. For more daily investing tips and real estate secrets, don't forget to visit breakfreerealestate.com and make sure to like, subscribe, and share our podcast. We will see you tomorrow.